I'm here with Vineet Rai. Jed, who just prowled the stage really well, says that Vineet is one of the best examples of a fund manager that's multilingual within a cultural context. So, uh, yeah, I, I think those are the words I'm supposed to say about you. <laughs> Uh, I kind of met Vineet, seriously, a month or so ago in Singapore, and we were on a panel. We just said, well, you know, I kind of like the way you do things. Let's see what we can do together. And so we're up here to, to talk about how we might do things together. He does SANCAL, the largest uh, event other than SOCAP that's focused on this, that's much more entrepreneur-focused and Indian contextual, and you know, they can talk back to investors to say this doesn't work here and stuff like that. And we're, we have a Western kind of focus here at SoCap, more investor focus than SanCap. And uh, we want to explore a learning partnership. Uh, if you look on the slide, the story down in the, uh, the learning and sharing story is about Vineet and me talking and what we're trying to do together. And Vineet has a lot of really good ideas about it. He's thought a lot more about it, and I've responded to it. I think it's some really good stuff that we want to do. This is going to be an announcement of a partnership, and we have a couple things that we, that we want to do. Do you want to describe some of your ideas? Yeah. Uh, first, uh, thanks, Kevin, and thanks, everybody, to uh, allow me to come here and speak to you. Uh, Sankalp was actually an initiative of IntelliCap, uh, which is a company that works across the bridge, tries to do everything that's possible to be done to create value. Uh, and the infrastructure that is needed for capital to work. Run by a fairly young set of people and was set up actually around 2002. Uh, today morning, I actually had a chance meeting with the, one of the persons who was the first investor in, uh, in IntelliCap some seven years back. And uh, he was coming back from a meeting with uh, Alan Greenspan. And uh, I was trying to tell him, I normally start my conversations by saying impact investing is contextual. So your learnings of what you are doing in one place may not work in the other place. And it's actually a fairly uh, well-known thing. And he said that when you're talking about investing, and he had heard this from Alan Greenspan yesterday, it seems, that capitalism is cultural, actually. And until unless you want to make capitalism work without understanding culture, it's bound to fail. And I think impact investing has similar context. So what actually impact investing can do in the United States of America is not going to be needed or will be effective in India. And possibly what can be done in impact investing in India is possibly not going to be needed or work in Kenya. Problem is that capital is actually still flowing from west to the east. But the actors are actually all based in the east largely. And I think the partnership that we are talking about is emerging from the thought process that what we do at Sankalp is so different from SOCAP while the objectives are the same, the process, the culture, the context is so very different that there is a need for a north-south dialogue. And this actually emerged when I and Kevin were sitting in Singapore trying to actually pull fast ones on the limited partners who invest in this space. And it seemed to me that we are actually talking to different languages, coming from different contexts, and doing things differently. So what appeared to me is the right way to move forward is to actually rise, and that's actually what I was telling Kevin, that my last decade, last 10, 12 years of my life has actually gone in survival, in trying to serve my own objectives, in trying to serve the objectives of my own institutions. Having trying to be an impact investor, I think one of the first objectives that was actually important for me was to rise above myself. But actually, I, what I did was serve all my interests for the last 10, 12 years. And for the possibly the next decade for our life, we might have to spend doing something which is beyond my personal needs. And I think a lot of people here in this room possibly want to play in impact investing to do that, but we have done the reverse for the last decade, at least to serve my needs. So if SOCAP and Sankal claim to be actually two very large uh, conveners of people who are either participant or actor in the change that we are trying to make, we need to actually rise beyond our personal ambitions of being the largest, the best, the one that changed the world, to actually become the dialogue conveners and see if we can create value for each other. So that was, was the objective with which we started a dialogue. And yeah. uh, I know I've gone into a long monologue, uh, but that's what I love. I love hearing my voice as well. Yeah. <laughs> Kevin, yeah. <back> here. <laughs> I, I think you know, one of the things we do in the West is create a lot of silver bullets. And, you know, they, in, in India and the other places, he's working in Southeast Asia and also heading toward Africa with IntelliCap and his, his group at Sankalp. 
they can know like how stuff works there. You know, like is there somebody to install it? Is there somebody to repair it? Is there somebody to install the new one and upgrade it and collect for it? And or are the roads too bad? Or the you know, I, I rented all kinds of westerners who are saying, yeah, I'm real excited about my new technology, and I wanted to say, well, you know. Who's who's your partner there? You know, I mean, are you partnered with the bodegas for collection, or, or who's, who's your who's your easy partner where, where you're an easy product? And how have you figured that out? And very often they, there was a guy uh, <clears throat> last year who he really had a really great solar technology and had figured it out. And in this one part of Kenya, uh, the Catholic justice worker was more trusted than both the government and the tribes. And he opened all the doors, and everybody adopted this wonderful you know solar technology that took out kerosene. And he says, I, I really knock it. Well, great. Where else is the Catholic justice manager more powerful and more trusted than any other thing? I think you, 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 you said, well, there's only this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so sometimes you know, he, he figured out one valley, but, but he couldn't figure out the, you know, the, 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 the context. He had somebody that opened the context to him. So I think we do a lot of these you know, silver bullet things, but you know, we've got to figure out how it works in India, there's a lot, a lot we can learn going that way so we won't be, you know, white folks with silver bullets saying do it this way. I think there's a need for white folks with silver bullets because... Uh, yeah, oh, I think so, so too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, a, it's actually very critical in some sense because uh, if I go back, I think uh, there are a couple of things I wanted to add to my own personal journey. Uh, and to a lot of you, possibly, who actually do not know the cultural context, do not have the skills, and still want to make a difference, that may actually sound pretty, pretty similar to what you were. So I was actually a guy who was trained to be a forester. And actually, before I started the fund and IntelliCap, I actually used to live in a forest. So I actually was a guy who should hang on the trees uh, and jump like monkeys. But I then, one fine day, decided that there is a need to change the world. Or at least I figured out that there is actually, rural India is 70% of India. And Mahatma Gandhi had said that 70% of India lives in, or India lives in villages, so we should do something about the villages. But when liberalization took place in 91, we adopted the service model, which basically needs, seeks talent and seeks infrastructure, which meant India's growth congregated towards cities. So 70% of India that lived in rural India actually was left behind. So while India grew, this urban India grew by 12%, the rural India grew by 1%. And in 2000, it was pretty obvious that uh, if you don't bring about a change in rural India, 70% of the India would not associate with the growth that was taking place in 30% of India. So like any person living in the forest who thought he was the brightest guy around, uh, and after meeting a lot of people, I realized that you need to create enterprises in rural India. And uh, after asking a few questions here, and you can ask anybody who's an entrepreneur around in this room, that what is it that you need, they will say we need money. So the easiest thing I could conclude is people need money to start business, and that money is not available. And uh, so in my brightness, I quit my job and started a fund with $2,100 at that exchange rate. Indian rupee devaluation has now made that $1,500 already. So I started with this $2,100, and uh, of this $100 went into setting up the fund and $2,000 went into setting up intellectual capital, which I thought, or IntelliCap, the company, which I thought would attract the best of the young talent and try to change the world. Uh, now, a lot of people ask me, how did you survive a guy from the forest trying to raise a fund whose family in the last 300 years have never been an entrepreneur to actually run a venture capital fund whose definition you learned from Google? How did you survive? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it actually then links back to the white man with the silver bullet, because you have the ambition and the passion to make a change. Sometimes context and content doesn't matter. I'm one of the brightest examples of this context and content didn't matter, because I did not know how to invest. I did not know what financial model looks like. I did not know how an entrepreneur looks like. And more importantly, I was trying to raise money without knowing how rich people look like. So, so if I can do it, a lot of you can do it. <laughs> It's important to be aware what you don't know. And the mm. good part was I did not know how to run a venture fund. So I went and asked very, without any shame to people that I want to raise a fund, would you invest in me? And if somebody asked me how would you exit, uh, I had actually read a paper from IFC which said 93% of the world actually ex struggle on exits. I said I am in the majority. We don't know how to exit. So, so I think accepting what you don't know possibly is one of the best ways in case you want to be those guys who want to become from participants, eager participants to actors. 
And I think the partnership that we are talking about between Sankalp and SOCAP is actually to connect the actors who basically we represent, we believe, is what Sankalp is all about, with the participants, which I believe is what SOCAP is about. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind Meaning of... like intermediaries, investors, consultants, researchers, yeah, all those kinds. I think there is a second part of it, which I think is a very California thing, and I still struggle to connect with that, but I actually <laughs> admire it because I can't connect with it is you can actually discuss and debate things that we cannot even conceive of. So if you come to Sankalp, if any of you have attended Sankalp, you will see we are very focused on doing things in one way. But when I come here, I see faith, ocean. I mean, I'm actually struggling to connect the, all these unconnected, this thing. It may be because you are SOCAP, or it may be because you have California. We have paths up there. <laughs> We have paths on the infographic. Yeah, just, so, just follow the path. So, so I think the white man with the silver bullet is equally important in correcting people like me who, who talk about spirituality but oh, yeah. don't understand it the way you understand it. So. I, I, well, you know, I moved here from Mississippi. Most of my uh, business career was in Mississippi, which is highly contextual. It's kind of like, you know, if you're a Johnson from up the North Road, everybody knows what you can do and what you can't do. And I moved here in 96, and they said, well, you, you know, I talked about something. I was involved in public schools in Mississippi that was, they didn't like or whatever. I said, well, you know, in California, you can just eliminate any part of your past you want to and, and, and reinvent yourself. It's like, oh. So I don't have to be the guy that said I was in Mississippi. Okay. I kind of liked it because I've been going upstream in Mississippi all, you know, for 20 years. I think that's why we get along. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It, it, you know, California is a place to, like, you know, re reinvent yourself. And, you know, then you go to India and it's like, oh, maybe I'm not really that, you know. I think that reality check. And I'm, I'm, we're also interested, you know, there is this opportunity that we've talked about, about the foundation. I'm going to go off and talk about that, too. As you've seen here, there's a lot of collaboratives uh, of foundations that are working together here. You know, there's the uh, Packard, which is the kind of leading oceans group that is getting everybody with a sort of different theory of change that's kind of overlapping, like Rockefeller does coastal communities, Packard does sea, and... Uh, Gordon Moore Foundation does whole ecosystems, and Bloomberg wants to be around the new smart stuff, and there, other folks are coming into that space. And uh, we want to help those collaboratives and those discussions carry forward, you know, between SOCAP and then also with the research that, you know, IntelliCAP is 600 people and they do lots of research. So we're going to figure out there is a real clear market opportunity. I don't know how to deliver on it. Our team is not based, uh, we don't have a service orientation and he's got a, a business that does. So we're going to. We're going to see if there's an opportunity to come to market there on something that we can't do that he could provide, and we're going to, you know, tiptoe in and try to be, uh, you know, foundations need a certain kind of convening, you know, behind only some people in the room, that kind of thing, and uh, work with you on that, too. No, I mean, uh, again, the learnings that we have got from the context in which we have worked with, I, again, would be very cautious in saying that we may, might be able to educate people here. Uh, with the same thing, it's a brown man with a silver bullet <laughs> may also not work. <laughs> but, uh, but I think uh, what we have done and what we have learned is uh, uh, capital alone doesn't work. Uh, yeah. Knowledge of context is important, but is actually not, again, a solution for you. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, you need to actually build an ecosystem. And uh, every effort that we each one of our try, and Silicon Valley possibly is the best example of what an ecosystem should look like. Uh, the problem is this ecosystem functions at a certain kind of, uh, with a certain kind of context and certain kinds of uh, uh, businesses. So when we went back and what we tried to do in India was actually a lot of us trying to come together to build an end-to-end -end solution to come creating companies that are actually focused on base of the pyramid and yet create successes. So it's not about just creating capital. It's not about taking young, smart people and trying to provide services to young people. Uh, it's not about actually just finding few incubators and trying to expect them to deliver results, but actually all of this together, spent together, being working together for a decade for us to deliver certain kinds of results in India. And I think one of the two things that I continue to repeat in every forum that I get to speak to about impact investing is there are two things which are very critical. Patience and patience, impatience with patience. Both the things are very important. Patience is important because results don't come in quickly. But impatience with patience is important because bad things, patiently waiting around a bad egg is not going to deliver you the chicken that you're looking to. So you need to be impatient when you need to be, but you need to be patient to actually deliver the final result. That's actually a very important part. The other part which actually continues to remain a debate 
is there is a very high number of people who are participating in the impact investing world who believe they can have their cake and eat it too. Now that belief is flawed, and it is flawed simply because you cannot generate world-making returns while changing the lives of the people. Not because it cannot be done, because we don't know it can be done. <coughs> so, to go with that expectation that you will do it is not necessarily possibly the right way to go in. And I think it is also connected with the materialism that we are suffering with. I think there is a need for us to, in general, introduce the course of greed management. Now, management school education has actually been introduced by United States to the world. I think it's important for the United States, the best of the colleges here, to introduce a fairly significant course on greed management. Uh, I know it's actually a wrong thing to say in a country which actually says greed is good. But uh, at the same time, I think it's time has come for us to possibly revisit some of these uh, possibly things which were right. Maybe greed was good at a certain point of time. But 2008 actually did tell us in this country itself that extreme greed is not good for anyone. And yeah. I think impact investing, if we are actually expecting that we will become as rich as uh, anybody who is in the mainstream, then possibly we are really exceeding our briefs. And, maybe is not the right way to go into this space. So if you're looking for mainstream returns, you're looking for mainstream salaries, you want to change the world at the same time, uh, maybe you are better off being an eager participant sitting from the far, admiring it, rather than being a participant. Mm -hmm. To be an actor, you'll need to make some sacrifices, and those will be pain painful. And if you're not accepting of that fact, better be an admirer than be a participant or an actor. Mm. Yeah. You know, that's great. Seth Golden's interesting point was that, yeah. Seth Golden's you know, success was partly that he uh, pushed back institutional capital that was demanding too much and would distort his business. And he, he succeeded because he got, he, he pushed away the institutionals and found mission-focused capital. One of the things he also did in, the, in his deal that was interesting, just to get wonky for a minute, but he had a warrant so that if the deal really succeeded, the investor would get less, and if they really failed, then the investor could do the gouging that the investor was comfortable doing. But you know, you, you can only be a pirate if you're on the bottom. If you're on the top, he, you know, it, it, the entrepreneur got a better deal. We have, to, we have to, you know, all this stuff seems to be restraining the power of rapacious capital. Uh, I think the things happening in the U.S. that are helping us with that are things around collaborative commerce. If people are sharing, then they're consuming less. and. You know, the, the power of capital to cause consumption is less. I think in, you know, there's some other things. The maker movement is really interesting here because it's local production, you know, 3D printing and stuff like that. We're, when we're moving our hubs into uh, Brooklyn and Philadelphia, we're, t we're linking with Third Ward, which is a group that sells 3D printers by time and, and uh, you know, stuff you can't afford in your shop. So there's local manufacture, local food production that is becoming really big in the U.S. All those things reduce the power of capital. I think capital's got, you know, if they have, but they're playing this power game, it's not working anymore. You know, you can't really extract the way they imagine the world works. So I think it's put, partnering with you to bring the entrepreneurs more to the fore is totally, I think, what we need to do as we go forward and, you know, continually to make capital a tool rather than, like, being in charge, you know. Yeah, I have a theory, and we discussed it in Singapore. Uh, it's politically incorrect for me to say it here, but I'll still go ahead and tell you this. So I have a theory. It's uh, the entrepreneur and the capital has an inverse power relationship. So mm -hmm. uh, intellect, uh, intellect and power relationship, actually. So if you actually try to make a hierarchy of intellectual capital or intellectual capability, the entrepreneur is at the top. The general partner or the fund managers are at the mediocre level, and limited partners are at the bottom. Uh, when you, uh, if you actually start looking at the power hierarchy, the limited partners are at the top. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The general partners, people like me who are mediocre, always remain at the center. And the entrepreneurs are at the bottom. Of course, these equations do change as entrepreneurs become successful. But literally, this is actually how it functions. So the power actually, and, and I actually spend a lot of time trying to understand why does a lot of people who try to do due diligence on you are looking for a certain specific answer? So if you say an answer in a word or in the system, it doesn't fit into the question that has been asked, you will be tick bogged the wrong way, and you will never get the capital. And it was completely amazing to me that you have a checklist way of actually telling me if I'm a good investor or a bad investor, while I was actually doing everything from an input and output perspective where I, my decision making to make investments were very instinct driven. Mm. And uh, mm -hmm. over a period of time, I realized that the larger capital you manage, the dumber decision making you must have. 
and which actually relates to the power of capital as well. So the larger amount of money you have, you have to think less and structure more. And therefore, there's actually this correlation that I discovered with experience. And I think we are moving towards it as Avishkar actually becomes larger and larger. We are moving towards dumb decision making as well internally. Something that worries me and keeps me awake. Yeah, that being time. big it can, can cause yeah. you to lose things. Yeah, we're looking at a holding company next time rather than a fund that has to get out. The timing of, of five-year venture funds or whatever versus impact is sometimes in line. It's really in line right now at Obamacare and mobile health because uh, uh, you can change the game with mobile health right now around Obamacare to you know, make lives better for the working poor in the U.S. They finally count in the system and you can make lots of money keeping you know, poor folks working poor out of the emergency room uh, using mobile apps to help you do that. That's a time-bound and opportunity. It makes sense to put that on a venture timeline because I think it's really important that we institutionalize Obamacare because it it's at, it's at lots of different kinds of risk, and we can have a much safer, better healthcare system in the U.S. if we, you know, throw a lot of venture capital at that and a lot of entrepreneurs at that kind of thing. Uh, but it's, it doesn't happen often that the overlap of the margin and, and impact are, are alike. It's a real brief window. I think uh, I'll actually connect what you just said about U.S. to India's economic woes right now. We have mm -hmm. a rupee devaluing pretty rapidly and sharply. And uh, so therefore the government is scurrying around for cover trying to actually look at what is it that we cannot stop from importing. And we figured out India's second largest imports are for electronic goods actually, surprisingly. While oil is actually a necessity, there's no reason for us to actually import gold and uh, electronic goods. And then there is a lot of time which has been spent trying to understand why don't we produce electronic goods. It's simply because we have never invested in trying to create infrastructure to produce electronic goods. So at this point of time, hmm. Indian government is actually talking about setting up venture funds which will actually invest in, uh, now actually this will take 10 years or 15 years to create impact and by the time we would have devalued as much as we <laughs> possibly don't need to. But uh, this is actually one way, like exactly as you said, you can actually have capital trying to create new ideas to solve these problems, whether it's in US, but they can all impact your main economies finally. And it, totally depends on, and that's why I think in some sense impact investing is nothing but a transitional activity. Things that start as impact can over a period of time move to mainstream. And, <coughs> and there, there was a mainstream venture capital fund managing partner who sat on the stage in India and said, the difference between impact investing funds in India and mainstream funds is one claims to give lower returns, the other gives lower returns. So, <laughs> <I think. laughs> yeah. You know, in, in uh, mobile health, I think actually the impact funds, there's lots of t typical venture funds jumping into the opportunity. You know, people with type 2 diabetes, chronic uh, diseases of, of the working poor. But I think we, we could add cultural literacy to that to get wider adoption more quickly because suddenly the, the voice of the poor folks is the most important consumer voice in the uh, healthcare system. So you have to have entrepreneurs that know how to listen to poor folks as if they're the most valuable customers, which is, they don't really teach you that at Stanford, you know? At Stanford and Harvard, they teach, you know, you don't know the last name of your maid, and now you have to start you treating poor folks as if they're valuable customers. I think it's going to, it's curious to see what if you sprinkle an, an MBA into a cultural literacy demanding situation and see what comes out. I think they, they might change a little bit, too. I have lately yeah. developed a soft corner for Stanford because they are doing a business case study on us. So they are. Uh, I may we, disagree with you for some they, they make the best silver bullets. They're, they do. <laughs> it's great. They just got to figure out, you know. Now that the, the poor folks have to adopt the behavior change that is, you know, where they're managing their chronic diseases better through mobile apps and things, they have to, they have to learn to listen to folks they hadn't listened to before. It's kind of a, I don't know, it's kind of, kind of a flip for them. Maybe, I mean, we have been actually doing a one-way flow of information. Maybe if the audience want to participate. Yeah, something. can we open this up for questions and things? We, we can talk a long time, but, but what do you want to ask him? Anybody? Do we have uh, mics and things? Okay, great. Good. If you were not bold, we would consider ourselves amusing and keeping going, so that's good. Hi, my name is Lloyd. So, I've actually just taken a mobile health without borders course at Stanford. Mm. And so, it's appropriate for me to ask a question. Great stuff. Um, and I've worked with the city of San Francisco in trying to figure out food deserts here. And so last year, I participated in a design jam where I had teammates that lived in the Tenderloin here, so one of the poorer neighborhoods. And 
you know, taking a design, taking into consideration design perspective, what they wanted was a access to a local grocery store. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But from a, you know, you flip it from the investor perspective, the margins for fresh goods and produce, um, vegetables, is so low that even though I know what the residents in the community wanted, that's not what makes sense from a return on investment, whether mm -hmm. it's short term yeah. um, or medium term. How do we end up bridging that you know, from a healthcare to a commerce, which are different industries, and at the same time serving the needs of, you said, um, the poorer residents in the community. Yeah, I have an example. We, our hub is right at Six Street. I've worked with folks, you know, the caravan folks out of TechSoup doing mobile stuff. There's some problems that you can solve with mobile in Six Street. And one of the ones that they just rolled out is a thing called uh, Safe Night. And it's, uh, and every night in the U.S., there's 6,000 or so women who need a place in a, ba in a battered women's shelter and there isn't one. They got a grant from Microsoft and some other folks to use latent hotel rooms around cities where, and somebody could donate to put up $25 and you could give, give a night and then it's also secure because nobody's supposed to know where she is. So I mean there are places where complex social problems with the transaction can equal mobile. Food deserts are not, there's too many other, there's moving stuff. So there, there, there's, a, there's some, one that Tenderloin Technology Center is rolling out right now that's really cool is a mobile app and homeless folks in San Francisco have smartphones and it's where there's a meal now and where there's a bed now throughout the system, uh, you know, and, and with the problem of updating. Some places that works. Some places, you know, it's a good technology, doesn't work there, you know. So solve it. Moving stuff is not a mobile problem. You know, moving data, moving transi transactions is, a, is an easy mobile problem. And then finding latent, you know, they did latent inventory. So I'm really interested in it, but it's, you know, it's cool technology. It doesn't work everywhere. That's one of the things, you know. F figure out how to do shipping, distribution, and receiving in a whole different way. That's, Every organic problem company has that kind of thing. Distributors suck. Yeah. yeah I mean, I wouldn't come in because he's an entrepreneur and he's on the intellectual hierarchy much above me. So. <laughs> I have a question over here. I'm behind you. Um, the problem that keeps you up at night about the pitfalls of scale and the pitfalls of growth. Um, can you tell us what ideas you're having about solving that problem while you're losing sleep? It's to me. Yeah. So what keeps me awake? Well, I think uh, one of the fears, and very simple fear, is actually to become dumb. And I actually see a sense of it as the number of people increase and then the amount of capital under management increase. Uh, instead of following the instinct, we are actually worrying about the fears. Uh, I've always defined that uh, investing, any good investor should actually be focused on what he controls and should not really be bothered about the outcomes, and the outcomes are actually seen as uh, uh, returns and impact you make. Uh, so I have never really bothered either about the return nor about the impact. I only focus on whether I can actually find a good entrepreneur. Uh, if he's trying to solve a good problem that actually has a business case to it, and if my capital can make a difference, these are the only three questions we ask. Uh, the, the larger we are becoming and the further I am going away from actually doing that activity, I am realizing transferring this very mediocre thought process to very intelligent people is one of the toughest things I have come across. People question everything and say the financial model doesn't give justify your instinctive decision making. So taking input-based decision to create value versus outcome-based decision making is something which keeps me awake. And I really don't have an answer because all the management institutes really makes you focus about outcome. And uh, I think the societies in the world, like the Western societies that a lot of Eastern societies want to emulate, are very focused on output metrics rather than the input side. While the best and the brightest of yours are still focused on the input side, but in general, the metric that is told to the average Joe like us is to focus on the outcomes. And I think that's basically a challenge that I have not been able to put my hand around. So. Hmm. The, I have four things that bother me. I mean, you know, that we have to work within. We have climate change. We have 
peak oil, the end of cheap oil, and a looming food crisis that's pretty global. And then I think <clears throat> the thing that I liked about what they did at Singapore is they think the biggest risk is uh, uh, the haves, uh, the have-nots getting mad at the haves, saying, if there's no path upward, I'm coming to get yours. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's, that's, a, that's a pretty, they all have some kind of timeline around those. So I think you know, we need to solve the uh, inclusion problem that, because I think we have a resource problem. So it's you know, that kind Absolutely. of thing. We have about a minute left. Uh, oh, I, I want to also express that I'm really glad that the Canadian minister is here. I know that was something I was supposed to do. And um, so it, it, we're, we're about at our end, but I, you know, we're starting a partnership. Neither one of us really knows how the, we're going to work with the other, but I think we have things to learn from each other. So, you know, we're trying to be kind of multiple. Oh, yeah, you have a quick question. Great. Hi, Kevin. Um, yeah. My name is David Munyanapti. I'm here from Lebanon, and I was fortunate to no enough yeah. to actually be yeah. at uh, Sankalp as well mm. um, uh, in, in Mumbai. And uh, coming from the Middle East, we are actually really excited about the amazing stuff that we saw at Sankalp and the stuff that's happening in India and the amazing sort of breadth and energy and, and enthusiasm and entrepreneurs, etc. And of course, there's always room to grow, but I just want to sort of counter that it's not just a sort of white man silver bullet that can go and solve things, but we're, we were also really looking to India um, and looking to build bridges between the Middle East and, and eastward, and was wondering in terms of some of the key things that you guys have been doing there that could be of benefit to other developing countries. Whereas um, sometimes I feel like coming from Silicon Valley, um, which is where I grew up, sometimes there's gaps because um, entrepreneurs, innovators here don't always understand some of the core issues that are troubling, that are problematic in some of those developing right. landscapes. Take about a minute. Go ahead. Yeah. That's, your, that's to you. Yeah, well, I think uh, part of the reason both of us are on the stage and Kevin was uh, nice enough to let me come on the stage. Uh, was that we actually believe that today we have actually, between SOCAP, SUNCAL, what we are doing, we have figured out some things that can actually be taken forward. Now, again, the context is important, and as like you said, whether we can do something in the Middle East that can create significant value. Mm -hmm. I think the learnings that we have with all the people here and what we have seen, what you saw in SUNCAL as well, is there something that we can pick the best from both the sides and takes? to the Middle East, and possibly to Africa, that's what we are trying to do, is what we are trying to plan. And uh, a late night mail from Kevin actually called it Global Impact Investing Information Network. Right, right. The G in. G triple in, <laughs> triple I in. And I think that, that if we can actually come up with something that can create or take the debate and harmonize the differences that we have on what impact is and what investing is and where capital will go, uh, and what kind of impact we should make, we might have created something that could benefit all of us much beyond what we are doing in Mumbai and San Francisco. Yeah, so I think so. with that. Thank you. So, thank you.